Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Terra CRG. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Colliers International, NYC, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Eastern Union Funding, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. So we have the kid from Trenton. We spoke about him last week, you know, William and Mary, New York Law School. And what happens now? Uh, I thought it was a law firm, but it was a brokerage house. Right. 19 Carter Berlin. Right. So tell me what happens. You're in the closet at the, at the brokerage house. Right. There's this, there were three guys at that time, Carter Berlin and Weil. Right. And they're a brokerage house. What, what do you know about brokerage house? I knew nothing. Um, um, I, and, and I was embarrassed by that. But I took the job. And obviously, they, they were a small company. So they didn't have a human resources department. They didn't have a procurement department. They didn't have anything. So I became those departments. And so if there was a, a, a personnel policy, I would write it while I was in the closet. Um, and right. I, so I did odd jobs. So you did odd jobs, and then you went to the reserves, the army. Right, I, and that was I, that was three months after I started, and I was three months in law school. So I had to leave law school, and I had to leave my job to go into the reserves. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, um, uh, in October of of that year. So it's 1969. You come back. I come back in February. And, and Sandy still has a job for you. And I come back and I ask for the job, but I tell them this time I wanted it permanently because I I'd really liked the three months that I had spent. I liked uh, hearing brokers, but I wanted to now get into the brokerage side of the business, not writing personnel policies. So in those days, they were called registered reps, uh, RRs. <laughs> now they're called financial consultants, which I take credit for, by the way, um, which we renamed in the 80s. But... Um, so I took my uh, RR exam, my principal's exam. You did it all in one day, not like it is today, which is difficult. Um, and I became a, a broker um, uh, while I still did things for the company. Because uh, Sandy says, I, I told him I wanted to be a broker. He said, fine, but you still got to do the other things also. Uh, so I did. And... Um, that company morphed from Carter Berlin and Weil to Kogan Berlin Weil and Levitt to ultimately uh, CBWL Hayden Stone. We bought a company called Hayden Stone, which is a was an, an old, old Boston Brahmin, you know, uh, white shoe kind of a company. Um, Perfect in, for the group of Kogan Berlin in 19, or Levitt. In Park. 1970. Um, I would have been 71. Right. And at this time, you're involved with underwritings? 
I'm involved in the syndicate department. Syndicate department. And I got involved uh, with syndicate and selling new issues and um, underwritten by ourselves and other companies. And so that's the way I got involved so, in the retail. So 1973, business. what happens? 1973, um, actually 74, uh, CBWL Hayden Stone. We dropped CBWL because a um, a research study showed, which we already knew, nobody knew who CBWL was. They used to call it corned beef with lettuce. Uh, it was a joke on Wall Street. So it was just Hayden Stone. Then we merged with Shearson, and it became Shearson Hayden Stone in uh, 1974. So, so it's 1974. The kid from uh, Trenton is now with Shearson Hayden Stone. Right. And what are you doing at that time? Um, I now uh, emerged from the syndicate department because we had done a deal uh, for Jimmy Ling, which was the evolution of or the rebirth of conglomerates, which were big. Right, in the when 60s. we had uh, Gulf and West, uh, we had right. Rapid America. Rapid yeah. American with Rickless and so forth. So we were going to do a rebirth of that called Omega Alpha. Uh, there was a big screw up in the back office. Without getting into details, I got involved, I fixed it. I always looked for ways to become obvious. If nobody knows you, whoever's watching, go make yourself obvious. Go do something where you could stand out and do something, you know, where it doesn't matter. And as you know, Italians in those days on Wall Street were in a back office most of the time. Um, so I had to do something to make myself obvious. I fixed this problem we had. Um, so I got noticed um, and I got promoted to then going around to the retail branches um, and, um, and selling to the brokers the wares of the syndicate department, how syndicate worked, our research, uh, things that we were doing. Um, and it was really And is that stuff. when you got involved with going down to the Fort Lauderdale office? Yeah, I got involved in the Fort Lauderdale office, which was after um, uh, I had created what I thought was uh, um, certificates of deposit sold in the brokerage business. Right. In essence, you were the forerunner. I mean, it was 1974 when the reserve fund was created. Right. But you were doing certificate of deposits right. and you were trying to right. basically create the money market. Fund. Yeah. Well, in those days, uh, Michael, as you know, cash balances in a brokerage account, you know, were not, were not uh, earning interest for the client. It was earning interest for the brokerage firm. Um, and interest rates were beginning to spike, so people were taking their money out. And you could go to a, a, a bank and say, I want a 40-day CD, and depending upon how much and money And you can you get had, a TV. Um, yes, you and you got a toaster and you got a TV. TV. And they'd say, I want a 40-day CD, and they would say, okay, we'll do you this and we'll give you this much interest. So we were losing a lot of the assets. And that's when I first started to understand that holding the asset meant future revenue, so you had to hold on to the asset. So I had this idea of wouldn't it be great if somebody with $5,000 could get the same rate on a CD as somebody with $100,000. So I said if you, if you combine all the money and you buy one big CD of 50 people who contribute to it, but you're allotted a piece of that, you can get an interest rate as high as somebody that's got a lot of money. So I thought that was a great idea. I remember going to the legal counsel then. His name was Malin Frankhauser. I'll never forget it. And I said, is this okay to do? He wrote a letter to the SEC, and he got no comment back. He didn't get a no comment letter. He just got no comment back. So I'd go around the United States. I'd raise a lot of money. It was a no-brainer. There was no commission. And I remember having a conversation with Sandy, and I said, as long as we keep the money, this is good. So we were doing a lot a day. There was like one CD a day. And I was going around the country, and I finally get to Lincoln Road, the old Lincoln Road in Miami Beach, which is now South Beach. But Lincoln Road had octogenarians. And I'm giving my speech, and there's a kid in the front row with a yellow pad and a crew cut. And the next day, I get a cease and desist order <laughs> saying, you can't do that. It's a registered security. And then um, uh, a few months later, uh, the reserve fund was born, and that was the first money market fund. Now, Shearson gets involved with American Express. 
Yes, I should just fill that gap for you. Between that story, I had run the Fort Lauderdale office for the company, and then I moved to, and we, after we merged with Shearson, um, I moved to uh, San Francisco to run the West Western How many years region. were you out there? I was there in, for seven years, and in 1979, we bought Low Road, so it was Shearson Low Roads in 1979. I stayed there until 81, was asked to come back, and soon after I came back, we were acquired by American Express. And um, when I came back to New York, I was head of uh, marketing and sales for Shearson American Express. And the next move? Um, and the next move was uh, uh, I did that for the most of the 80s. We bought Lehman Brothers in 1983. Uh, so I got involved in all the sales uh, of the company. I was responsible for that until 1990 um, when um, there was a, uh, we were still owned, it was now Shearson Lehman American Express. Right, and, and then there's divestiture. Lehman went one way, yeah, American and, Express sold Well, that off. was in 93. Right. I ran the Shearson part in 1990, and uh, Dick Fould ran the Lehman part, and that went on for three years. Um, it was an interesting set of circumstances, Michael, in that, um, we were one company, but as I like to say, separated at birth because we basically had the retail operation, which I ran, and the capital markets and investment banking, which was a Dick different ran. world. So we had to, the retail part had to use the, sheer, the Lehman part of the business to do business. So um, we were kind of divided, but together, and it was an interesting set of circumstances. Right. Now, it's 1990 or 1993 that Sandy comes back in your life again. 93. And by that time, um, Dick Fold, uh, who ran Lehman, um, and I decided that we could really do something great. And we were humming along for six months. We had more brokers than Merrill Lynch. It was, it was really good. We had all parts of the business covered, banking, capital markets, retail. It was really good. And then in 93, um, uh, American Express, who had issues with their own balance sheet at the time, which was part of this, um, decided to sell the Shearson part to Sandy Weil, um, who I got reunited with again. Right, that company, Sandy owned Smith Barney at this he time. He owned Smith Barney, he owned, uh, he bought a company called Primerica, which owned Smith Barney, uh, A.L. Williams, which was a large, uh, contingent of the term part life timers, insurance board. term life, which is by term, well, which investing. your father even became an agent for. My father, when I ran that company, became an RVP, a regional vice president, and that was one of the proudest days of my life. Was anointing him an RVP in front of thirty thousand people in the Georgia Dome. It was really cool. Right, but you also, when you were Primerica, which was the A.L. Williams originally over right. there. You know, it was the, the term insurance business that really was a very successful business. Yes, it was. And, um, and a good motivational where you spoke a lot on uh, the video screens, right? Well, I lasted Smith Barney Shearson, um, the retail part, for a couple of years. I was president. And then uh, that happened, went from 95, 93 to 95. And then Sandy asked me if I would run Primerica. And... Um, 150,000 people, mostly part-timers, that were football coaches during the day or postmen during the day, school teachers during the day, and, and um, salesmen and term insurance salesmen at night. And um, he had asked me to go there because there were some issues with compliance and things of that nature. So uh, running that company was less selling term insurance um, and more people Motivating looking the people. for hope and opportunity than anything else. Right, because I think in the book it was said that somebody went to you later on and said, I used to sell for Primerica or right. A.L. Williams, and, I, and you said, unless you're really into it, you don't go into the business, and he didn't go into the business. That's right. And he had a successful career. Then you subsequently, from Primerica, say he's still buying everything. Right. And he buys this little bank called Citibank, right? You're right. We merged with Citicorp. Citicorp. Um, Citibank was inside of Citicorp. By then, we were Travelers Group. Uh, we had originally owned 27%, then bought the rest. So Travelers Group 
was the name of the company, and underneath it was uh, Smith Barney Shearson, which became Solomon Smith Barney. We bought Solomon Brothers, which was a big deal. Um, we had Travelers Insurance. We had Primerica, uh, and we had Commercial Credit, which was the which is credit company in Baltimore that was the beginning of, of his, Sandy's his return, res right, resurrection. Right, that's um, when, he, when he bought that. In right. the 80s, and yeah. that's how he got to Primerica from commercial credit, et cetera, et cetera. And then you were president of Citi, uh, Citigroup. I was president um, of Citibank North America, and I was CEO of Primerica at the same time. Your father in baseball in Trenton. Let's talk about that. Wonderful story. My, my father... Um, was very dedicated to and committed to the resurrection of Trenton. Not unlike most Northeast cities, urban plight, uh, lucky that the state government was there. Uh, but uh, he was upset that the old neighborhoods were falling apart and he wanted to do something to resurrect the city. So he comes to me and he says, I got a great idea. He just had a quintuple bypass. And he he's said, 78 years of age. He's 78 years of age. And he says, I got a great idea. I said, you got to rest. Uh, you know, you got to go to Florida. You got to do all that stuff. And he said, no, I want to buy a baseball team. Now, you got to remember, 22 years ago, somebody saying they wanted to buy a baseball team. What are you, crazy? Because um, buying minor league baseball teams was not fashionable. Um, uh, and he said, if I get, I said, you're not going to get anybody to approve a stadium when a town has no money. He says, if I get the stadium, will you give me the money? It's a beautiful story in the book of how he convinces the town and the city government, the county government, to give him $16 million to build a stadium. Not to him, but they were going to build the stadium and he was going to lease it. Uh, my brother calls me and says, he's done it. I'm worried about his heart. And he calls me and he says, I got the money for the stadium. Now you're going to give me the money. And so I'm now... I'm, I'm trying to talk him out of it. And I said to him, well, you got the stadium, but you don't have a team. And uh, he says, if I get the team, will you give me the money? And uh, uh, as the story goes, I shortly thereafter, he just thought you had to call owners of big league teams and you get a team. And he called George Steinbrenner, who called me. Yeah, because he, your father was calling George Steinbrenner yeah. all the time. And, he, and Steinbrenner calls me and said, are you related to Sam Plumeri? I said, yeah. I said, it's my father. He says, tell him to stop harassing me. Because he was cold calling him, every major league owner. Um, finally, he starts the team. Uh, I don't believe in it. I still don't give him the money. He starts the team with debt. Uh, he operates for a year uh, with the Detroit Tiger organization. And um, at the end of the year, he's pretty successful, very successful, actually. But people are a little jealous of him because he's come in, but he's got no equity. And the rules of the league under Major League Baseball is you have to have so much equity, so much debt. So they come down to have a big meeting with him in Trenton. Uh, he asked me to come down. I've had nothing to do with it. Um, and you guaranteed it. And I saw my father in this meeting start to cry because they were going to take his team away. And I started to cry. I started crying now. Uh, and I told him, leave my father alone. I'll cover it. And it became one of the most successful franchises um, in all of minor league baseball. It was actually minor league team of the year for five of the 20 years that we've been in business. And eventually, um, I can remember an interesting story. The way it goes, but not enough time to get into it, but you don't pick the team you want. You They give you a team. They tell you who to get. And so... My father, after the Tigers, um, called me and he says, if you're heard from the league yet? I said, no, but they're going to call me soon. So they called me and told me that we were going to be an affiliate of the Boston Red Sox. Now, if you... Yeah, if you're a big Yankee fan. If you're, if you're a Yankee fan all your life, and my father obviously was a Yankee fan with Especially Rizzuto and DiMaggio and Barra, and I tell him we're a minor league affiliate of Boston Red Sox, I said, I said to him, just relax, Pop. And this is just business, strictly business. In 2000, you had met Henry Kravis over the period of time. He owned this staunchy British 
uh, insurance company, which probably had never seen an Italian guy, especially an outspoken Italian guy. Right. And then a couple of months later, you're in uh, Paris. Right. You run into Henry again. Right. And I think the joke was your wife said, what are you doing? Uh, I'm looking find for- Find them a job. Find them a job, and you found the job. Right. You go to Willis, and you turn this company around. Uh, a total different personality. And then I think the real interesting thing about Willis, especially since I know Joe Moynihan, is that how do you make Willis a great name over here? Right. And what you do is you said, here's this ugly tower in Chicago called the Sears Tower. Right. And Sears is no longer the tenant. Right. And you make a deal with the landlord. Right. At a great rent. Right. And besides the great rent, the deal to have the name the Willis Tower. Yeah, it's a great story, I think. Um, again, adversity, as we talked earlier, Michael. Uh, this was in, Willis had gone from privately $3 a share to $45 a share by the time we got to 2008. But during this period of time at Willis, you had another adversity. Let's talk about Chris. Yeah, and, and it all happened at the same time, which goes with the Sears story, which I think would be helpful for people to understand because it's a great lesson to me and a great lesson to others. So I, I buy this company called Hillbro Gal and Hobbs and I close in October of 2008 and uh, when the banks are going under so the bridge loans that I got to buy the deal start to sink and what I thought was a five dollar uh, five percent loan uh, for five hundred million dollars turned out to be a sinking bridge so I had to make it permanent and I got a, a loan, a mezzanine financing from a famous brokerage firm or uh, investment bank at 13 and a half. So now all of a sudden I got $40 million to pay more and it couldn't have been a worse time. In November of that same year, uh, my son Chris died. Uh, um, he had, had a bout with drug and substance abuse all his life. Um, uh, and obviously, I, I was in the throes of this deal, the worst possible time economically, and then my, my, my son passes away. Um, and you know, when you're in positions like that, you got two choices. You can either go hide or you can step it up. Um, and I've never been one to hide, and I stepped it up. I remember uh, Senator Bill Bradley, who's a good friend, who was our lead director at Willis, saying to me after Chris died, um, and I write extensively about my relationship with him as a father, which wasn't the greatest in the world. And I wish I had that all back again. And I, read, I write about it extensively so other people don't make the same mistake that I made and was closer to him. I mean, because Chris, you know, it, it was obvious at, at an early age when he was losing weight and then other times, you know, sometimes you can't see. You were going to Connecticut all the time to visit him. Right. And then he decided to go to the Culinary Institute, which was great. And, he, you know, he wanted to be a chef. Right. And, yes. and then, you know, downhill. Right. Every time I thought we were, like, over the tump, uh, he would then... He never really confronted the demons that he had. Um, and a lot of the demons had to do with me. Um, I just wasn't the father I should have been. I was more preoccupied with my, um, my own business career and my own success. Um, and I exhort people even today, and I do that in the book, pay attention to your kids, uh, hug them every chance you have, love them, they're the biggest priority you have. Um, but he passed away and there was nothing, you know, and I, I was, and, and, but I chose to go on. Um, and, um, uh, and February of that year, um, credit markets are closed. Um, uh, I wind up with five offices in Chicago uh, because I did this deal, which again was hard to do because of the, of the economic collapse. Um, I have to put all these offices together and the only building that had a lot of space was the Sears Tower. And the reason, Michael, was because when the leases came up, people would leave because they were fearful that the next terrorist attack- Right, because the height of the Sears building. Tower. Uh, I negotiate, um, you know, with Joe Mornion, who's a great guy, and but the economic and a true circuit, negotiator. And, and 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 anyway, we negotiate fourteen dollars and fifty cents a square foot for only two hundred fifty thousand square feet, two floors. And he said to me, "Do we have a deal?" And I said, "You know, it would really be great 
if you rename this tower because Sears has a is a jinx. People think of Sears Tower, they think of terrorists. If you put a great name up there, uh, it's going to change the whole uh, notion of the skyline of Chicago. He said, what name is that? And I said, Willis. That's well. Now, nobody in the United States really knew Willis as much as they did in other parts of the world. Everybody thought it was that kid who was a what's up Willis, right. you know, on television. So um, long story short, uh, he agrees to it. Um, uh, and we're only owning 250 or renting 250,000 square feet at $14.50 a square foot. I get the Sears Tower uh, renamed the Willis Tower. Right. And I remember when we went through the dedication ceremony that day uh, with uh, Rich Daly, who became a good friend and a supporter of mine in helping me get this done, uh, and so many other people. I started to cry as I heard the Chicago Children's Choir sing My Kind of Town, Chicago Is. The only person I can think of was my son and wish he was there with me. Let's talk about uh, your other son and daughter. Tell me about them. I have a son, Jay, who owns a restaurant in East Hampton. And uh, I have two grandchildren. Their names uh, are Jackson because he was conceived in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Okay. And uh, Ryder Rose, uh, Rose is my grandmother's uh, name. And then you have a daughter. And I have a daughter who has three children. And their names? And uh, their names uh, are uh, Callan, um, who's, uh, who's five, uh, Maya, who's seven, and uh, Hazel, who's three. And, and, and then my son had right. uh, a daughter who my ex-wife Nancy uh, did a great job raising uh, since she was two. She's now 14. And when my son passed away, uh, we adopted her. So um, I'm her grandfather and her uh, legal guardian. And it's uh, and then, interesting and when then I go to school. And then recently you, uh, you recently got married and uh, Jay was your best man, right? Uh, which was a wonderful occasion for all the reasons that you can imagine. Uh, I got married to Susan. Uh, Edgerton, who's Susan Plumeri, uh, on April 5th uh, of 2014, and uh, uh, we will have been married two years in, in, in April, and With my son was my best man. After Willis, you join First Data, yes. where you're the vice chairman. First Data had one of the largest IPOs last year in yes. 2015, and then you dedicate yourself to telling people with the power of being yourself? I tell people you have to have vision. You have to have, uh, along with the vision, commitment, um, because the vision is no good unless you're committed. Um, after the commitment, you have to have purpose. There has to be a real purpose for what you do. And if you combine vision and commitment and passion, uh, purpose, you get passion. And I preach that every so, day. So the kid from Trenton, who could have been teaching, you know, been a college teacher, okay? I think uh, great-grandfather, -grandpa your father, your mother who passed on at 97 a couple years right. ago. Everybody would be proud, and thanks for being my Thank guest. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it very much. A lot of fun. Thank you.